and oral history specialist. She also directs USU's community-based fieldwork projects, bringing the voices of diverse people from, out the, from throughout the Intermountain West, many of them who have been historically excluded, into the USU special collections and archives. And I have a list of some of her recent ethnographic projects, uh, one titled The Climate Challenge, one Voices from Drug Court, one is Great Salt Lake Wetlands Project. I remember we were in a meeting together right after she had been out at the, at the Great Salt Lake in the wetlands talking to people. Uh, election Reflections, the Cache Valley Refugee Oral History Project, and with the Crow Nation approval, she's currently working with Grant Boltail to ethically preserve his rich oral history collection. Today she's going to be talking about a program that she's, uh, or a project she's collaborating with uh, some colleagues on. It's titled Informing the National Narrative Stories of Utah's Opioid Crisis. And the project's trying to collect, preserve, present impactful stories from Utahns who've been affected by the opioid crisis and to help reduce stigma surrounding it. She's an archival liaison for the American Folklore Society. She's on the board. I think a permanent board member of the Folklore Society of Utah and vice president of the Cash Refugee and Immigrant Connection. And she's also the director of the board, uh, or the chair of the board of directors at Utah Humanities. Finally, she wanted me to mention she is also the, the grandma to 10 cool kids. So will you welcome me, or join with me in welcoming Randy to the stage. Super excited to be here with you all today. And I'm going to tell you something that's not part of my presentation. Forty years ago, next week, have expired since I was a freshman on this campus. This building, of course, wasn't there. Um, but Mary Nelson, I was living there. And um, I can't tell you how many impactful things happened because I chose to come to this campus. And one of them, I was just talking to Professor Allred, I remember being in one of my um, instructor's homes. I had a question, and she said, well, come on over. She was an uh, adjunct, and she didn't have regular office hours. So I went over to her home, and she said, if you don't mind, I'm going to be cutting my daughter's hair while we're talking. So I sat in her bathroom while she cut her daughter's hair and asked my question. And then we got talking about where I was from, and I said Las Vegas. And she started talking about how you know, that she didn't think that was that gorgeous of a spot to come from. And I remember saying, hey, wait a minute. And we had this interesting conversation. And I feel like that defines my moment, that she was respectful. And we started having this conversation about what I thought. And, and she goes, you know what, I'm going to look at the desert differently. And it wasn't about so much what I said, but what she said and how she reacted to me. I feel like Snow College positioned me to be an advocate, to help me speak up when I something didn't resonate with me, and then take other people's opinions and see how their opinions changed mine or vice versa. So today I am actually talking about um, activism, talking about archival activism. And if that isn't the most boring thing you've ever heard about in your life, archives, I mean, come on, you think about libraries and a lot of times we think, mm, snoozer. But what I want you to think about is a couple of things. And so I'm going to move through a few slides and I um, want to think about when people are writing history. History books, novels, um, the things you read in history courses, books about specific times. Where did they get all that information? How did they know what kinds of language was um, prevalent during that time? How did they know about how many people were around then? Or um, what kinds of topics people are thinking about? They get them from archives. They go to libraries. They do research. And so for the last 26 years at Utah State University, I've wanted to have the voice of the everyday person represented as well, especially people who, as um, Professor Alred mentioned, that are excluded, whose voices have never been considered to perhaps be part of that archival record. And so this idea um, is really prevalent today. And it has been around since the 60s um, when people started thinking about history from the bottom up, folklorists, which I am, and Dr. Alred, we're thinking about the everyday people and their experience. So this idea of archival autonomy, working with people to help them tell their own story, but not just going in and collecting from them, but asking them to be part of every step of the way. And so today I'd like to talk to you about a few of my projects, but I would love you to think about this idea of activism. Activism in, in any kinds of places where you situate yourself. 
Pardon me, I'm going to get my phone for a second, because I want to read you um, just briefly something I got yesterday. So this is coming from the Natural Resources Senator at Utah State University. It says, hello, you are receiving this email at USU, as a USU faculty uh, member that has been identified to have an interest in sustainability. As you may know, September 20th is Global Climate Strike Day. The students of USU are organizing a climate strike in conjunction with the, some 2 million students and citizens around the world to bring attention. And this individual goes on to talk about where we should all meet tomorrow and what we should do. And I think activism is the kinds of things that are important to you in your life. The, it might be on climate disruption. It might be on um, human trafficking. It might be on um, you know, better food at the cafeteria at your high school. It's, it's where it hits you. And it sometimes you're made aware of something because of an interaction you've had in a class with a friend, something you heard on the news, and then you activate something inside yourself. And so I want to say I have learned to be more actively engaged because of the people who have been generous with me over this career. And I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people. And every time I interview somebody, I learn something to be more compassionate or emp empathetic. And so this idea of autonomy is giving autonomy to, again, the people who to help with these societal changes, to make a difference where people are writing history, people are understanding, and also to be included in that record. So archivists and working with community members, we've got to be activists. We've got to do something when we see a need. And so one of those things might be um, putting efforts into collecting from communities and being a partner, making sure all the people in a certain community are represented. And that might be, yes, in an archive, but that also might be in a boardroom. That might be in a PTA committee. Like, if everybody you see in the grocery store doesn't show up in the meetings to make a difference in your community, then there's some efforts for activism of reaching out. And this second bullet, the lack of archival presence for many minorities or excluded communities in a repository, mirrors what occurs in our communities at large. And we find that, you know, these kinds of silences or gaps are troubling, and they create a gap in our record and a gap in our voting, a gap in our, the world that we live in. And so we can't exclude voices. So one of the things that I've been working on is figuring out whose voice is missing, right? And I don't know. I don't know. Who, if I don't know somebody, one of the first things I remember working on was the Latinx project. And back then, the term Latinx hadn't been um, around. And I remember just being in the grocery store in Cache Valley and recognizing there's a lot of um, Latina and Latino community members, but I remembered there was nothing from their voice in the archive. And I thought, that really is problematic. So we started out a project to work on that. But it has to be collaborative. Have you guys, and I can't really see you very good, but have any of you ever read something about your generation or about your hometown or your family from somebody um, you know, writing about you? I remember reading a National Geographic article about Las Vegas where I grew up, and I remember being like, yeah, that's a lot really true, but there's some pieces about it that they didn't get right. Have you ever, done, have you ever read anything like that? Yeah. How did it make you feel? Not good? You're like, what's up with that? Why are they representing us? And you guys, a lot of times people might, you know, you might be at a family party and someone's talking, and they're like, those kids these days. And you're like, they're not even reflecting stuff about me sometimes, right? So it doesn't feel good when somebody re represents you in a way that's not real accurate to you. It doesn't resonate. And I feel that same way. And so the way that we get around that is collaborating in partnerships with people whose story, we, that they want to have their story told, we want to tell their story, and sometimes it, it might be I'm thinking, oh, we need something from this community, and actively working to find a, a partner. Sometimes the partner comes to me. And so um, one of the things we, we, we have cool stuff at Utah State, not you know, before 26 years ago, but one of the things I did is I started combing through all the collections we had, and I made decided that we'll have an aggregate of all those things. So I called it Northern Utah Speaks for no good reason, just sounded like a good idea. And I said, let's partner with people, let's make these voices available, and then let's, let me teach people ethnography so they can do it themselves. And when I say and use the word ethnography, it's just a fancy word of saying I interview people for a living. And I do that, in a, a, um, as um, David said, in groups. So I might have interviewed a bunch of people about the Great Salt Lake and how they interact on that lake or people in Cache Valley that have um, come to Cache Valley as refugees or immigrants um, because of some disruption or war or um, a despot, and they can't live in their own environment. I want to talk to them about that experience, but also about being in Cache Valley to document that. 
So a lot of times, though, people say, well, teach us how to do that. We want to, we want to document our, our, do it ourselves. And so I've worked with um, a variety of groups to teach them to do that work themselves, and that's even better. And we have many collections, but I've got the arrow, I don't know, it's kind of small, pointed to something called the Cache Valley Refugee Oral History Project. And that was a project I did with my um, colleague Lisa Gabbert. We did that with the Library of Congress. We taught graduate students um, ethnography techniques, but we, the project was on refugees in Cache Valley. And, and every project I ever do, I amplify that voice, whether I write an article about it, or um, the front matter of a, a digital collection, or we often take it to the community. And I'll be up in front of people like I am in front of you, obviously a smaller venue, and we'll talk about it. And at the May 2015 Logan Library event for this Cache Valley Refugee Project, this young man came. His name is Andrew Dupree. And I frankly didn't see Andrew that day because we had a, there were so many people that came to that event, the room was too small. We were pulling in couches from the hall of the library. And so I was so busy doing crowd management and getting, making sure everyone had a seat that I don't remember either meeting or interacting with Andrew. But nonetheless, Andrew had done a little volunteering for the Cash Refugee and Immigrant Connection, which I'm on the board for. And he had heard about this event from one of the board members. And he came that evening. And then for a year, he percolated about two things I said. And he said that I, he told me what I said. And he said, you said that you work to give voice to people that are um, underheard or underserved or underrepresented. And he said, I feel like the um, Cash Valley Drug Court is one of those organizations that's underheard and underrepresented and that people don't know about, or if they do, they have um, maybe the wrong opinion about. And so he came a year later, May of 2016, and said, would you maybe be interested in doing a project with us? And I brought it to the Board of Curators at, at where I work, and we said, yes, that's something we really want to be involved in. And so from that point on, um, Andrew, myself, and Jennifer Duncan, began a process. And that, I won't go into all the details, but that's not just something you do overnight. I um, worked with the Institutional Review Board, which is an organization that's on every campus, to approve working with human subjects. I worked through the American Folklore Society, the Oral History Association, and um, the Society of American Archivists Best Practices to put in place all the kinds of things you need to do when you do an ethnography. And by September of 2016, we were ready to start interviewing. And we interviewed for six months, and we created a beautiful collection that's part of the Northern Utah Speaks. But then we started amplifying those voices. Before any work that happens, however, we've got to come up with the, the kind of the main where we're going to do this. And what I usually say is we're going to have a group charter. And we're going to work together with partners to make sure that we're having safe spaces for these stories to be collected. We're going to make sure we honor those stories, that we privilege privacy when people have something that they don't want on the recording. We want to make sure that people know we're not perfect. We might do or say something that's um, not, you know, might say a term that somebody finds pejorative. And hopefully they will say, hey, we don't use that language. Um, and we want to, you know, have people question and help us to get better at this work. And Andrew did all of those things. He was my docent. He was the guide for everything that we did. He taught me about terms like using dreams. And he taught me about um, different kinds of triggers that we needed to be aware of. And then I started going to drug court. I went to drug court, and I still go to drug court. I was at drug court just last Tuesday. Um, and every Tuesday at noon in Cache Valley, this building is drug court. And every, throughout the state of Utah, there are drug courts. Drug courts began in the um, 90s with Janet Reno, who you may remember as the Attorney General for the United States. She noticed that there was a lot of people who were incarcerated or dealing with, um, they were being arrested, but really their main problem was they had an addiction to drugs. And so they figured out they needed to do something, and they created this um, system. And there's many boutique courts, um, like drug court. There's veterans courts. There's um, a, a variety, mental health courts and so forth, that try to look at maybe the root problem. Um, it might not just be that somebody is taking illegal substance or even um, distributing that. They're trying to figure out ways to help. And so drug court grew up around that. And it was really pretty impactful for everybody involved, but I just have to say the person that was impacted, I was probably as much as anything, because when Andrew came, I'd never heard of drug court. 
And I don't know, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I know when I talk to other groups, sometimes they'll say, I didn't know about drug court either. And so that's just one way that we're at least making some justice, is letting people know that that, that uh, is available, and that's something that people are participating in. And then during the interviews, we had impactful stories like this. This is Andrew talking about coming to meet with me the very first time. He talks about the stigma. He talks about, yeah, uh, there's a complex of inferiority that comes with the experience of being on drug court and being arrested and being a felon. And so there's a lot of self-esteem issues and confidence that comes, and he meant like lack of confidence that comes with that. So there was a lot of hesitation, feelings of inferiority that came with that, and I was pretty nervous and pretty scared approaching you and talking to you. And I remember viscerally that day, I was thinking it was like maybe a graduate student coming. He emailed me and said, can I meet with you about the refugee project? And I thought he was maybe, a lot of people asked me about that. A lot of people want to get involved, so I thought that was what it was. And so when he sat down and started talking about drug court, I remember, and I remember him feeling and seeming nervous. And I remember thinking, I cannot mess this up. I can't promise him something I can't deliver. And so I didn't say yes right away. I said, let me, let me you know, because I knew how much work it would be. But I wanted to make sure that he didn't walk away from Utah State feeling like somebody had promised something they didn't deliver. We then took all the information and we started talking about it. So um, two years ago, right about now, Andrew and my other colleague, Jennifer, and myself presented about drug court at the Utah State History Conference. And it's coming up in a couple weeks. We'll be talking about the Great Salt Lake Wetlands for that one, this one coming up. But, ooh, I'm wearing the same dress. That's cool. Um, that was really impactful for all of us. But especially for Andrew, uh, and I say that just because he told me, that's important to be able to tell your story yourself. Um, we also were on the radio, and the gentleman in the white shirt is the judge. So here, can you imagine that you, for years, several years, sit across, you had a podium, and the judge is up there on the um, rostrum, and here is the, you are now on the radio with the judge, and you're a peer. That's, that's important to amplify these voices. And some of the voices in, in drug court talked about the scaffolding of drug court, and that would be helpful for people who might be thinking about their they might be going to be in drug court or their child. It might be interesting for somebody who's going to be writing about that. Again, thinking about the history and being able to amplify these voices and, and have them available, the primary source documents available, but also amplifying it. One of the most important things, I think, for any of us is when you start getting engaged with somebody with some kind of activism, that you've got to recognize you've got a partner, and then you've got to stay involved with what's important to the people you partner with. I have to self-disclose everything I've ever done in my career. I cannot stay actively involved but with the Refugee Project and with the Drug Court Project. I've stayed involved for quite a few years. I've been actively involved almost about eight years with the Refugee Project, and um, I've been engaged with the Drug Court Project ever since 2000. Uh, May of 2016. Um, and one of the things that I've been doing with Jessie, who you just read a little bit of her quote, is we started a year ago, September, a uh, book group. And we meet once a month. And we are, it's just an amazing, we met just Monday night and we talked about one of the books that one of the gentlemen in drug court wrote about his recovery. We've also read To Kill a Mockingbird, Educated, um, the Things They Carry by Tim O'Brien that um, David and I were talking about a little bit ago. We're reading for October, The Professor and the Madman, um, about the, the English Oxford Dictionary. We read and discuss, and then the people that are um, on drug court get um, excused one of their 12-step um, they have to do two per week, and they get to count that as one. And I'm really excited to tell you that the judge said that they can count two for this coming book. I'm not sure why, but... When I was presenting everybody about it on Monday at court, he said, we're going to count it as two. So that kind of parlays to this next thing that David talked about, this activism. You know, I think anybody in this room, I think we've all had a, a moment in our life when we've felt stigmatized about something. Somebody's talking negatively about something that's important to us, or we feel um, like someone's not understanding us and making us feel less than. And definitely the opioid crisis, or just in, in general, that um, substance abuse disorder that people, and I think in this room, there's probably people who are struggling, their families are struggling, their friends are struggling. You, 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 know, you don't have to go too far to know somebody that struggles with substance abuse disorder. Um, and 
learning about something and trying to make a difference in a variety of ways. And I work as in a library, and one of the ways that we can do that is in collecting these stories. And so I've been working with um, extension faculty that are dealing with this throughout the state of Utah. And we're working in 10 counties, and we're collecting the stories from um, partnering with community scholars, people who are actively involved in this process, whether they're in recovery themselves, they work at a recovery center, they are a parent of somebody in recovery, that, that we're partnering with them, and the person and the faculty from Utah State are going out in the communities and doing interviews. And right now we've got 19 done, and we have um, 10 more being, um, that are waiting to be transcribed, and then about seven or eight. So by the time this project's all finished, we'll have about 35 more voices to add to a digital collection. And then we're going to amplify these voices. I know you probably can't read this, it's pretty small, but down at the bottom it says, it's time we talk about the opioid epidemic as a community issue instead of treating it like a family secret. And if you saw and thought about the beginning of my slide, it talks about untellable stories. It's not that they're untellable, they're very tellable. It's just that we sometimes don't feel like we can tell them, that someone's going to react harshly. Somebody's going to stigmatize us. Someone's going to make us feel small. And that shouldn't be the case. Opioids are very addictive. They're not great. I'm not going to go say that they're a good thing. But they are very addictive. And the pharmaceutical companies knew that. I mean, so if we want to start you know, being stigmatizing somebody, let me, let's stigmatize those folks and not families in crisis. And let's collect those stories and let's communicate. And then maybe what this is about is finding out ways to curb that problem. And so a year ago, the, um, around the state, they had invited people to come to a summit. And about a month ago, there was a second summit on opioids in Utah. That first summit, I didn't go to that one. But I was told that it was you know, uh, judges, and it was uh, folks from Utah State, and it was folks from other universities, and it was medical professionals, and it was all these other folks. By the very end, somebody said, is a, and I think it was, you know, they raised their hand, they're like, where's all the people in recovery? Where's their voice in this thing? And so like a week later, I started working with Sandy Sulzer. Um, we were introduced together. She knew what my work had been, and we were, we were like, well, we've got to make a difference. We've got, and so last uh, month when the opioid um, summit, every single session opened with somebody whose story, they were... They, their voice, they were going to be part of the solution. And that's what I'm saying is part of the solution of history being told lies in the stories that we know. Part of the solution of opioid crisis lies in the voices of the people suffering and dealing with it day in, day out. And so that's making active change. Something happened from a year ago to now actively making a difference. And that's very cool. So 20 community members are involved in this project. And that's the most important voice. And then there's USU faculty and staff that are involved from the library where I work, from the College of Education where my um, colleague Sandy Selzer, and also the Five Heart or Extension faculty, the Health Extension Advocacy Research Team. And then we're working with Utah State University Press and a writer to amplify those voices. And our aim is to this beautiful digital collection. And by that I mean you can go online and, and read these interviews and listen to them. But then we're hoping, um, we're going to be doing some community conversations throughout these 10 counties. And I'm going to tell you about that in a second, because we're going to do a little uh, quick community conversation amongst ourselves. And then we're going to try to write a book about honoring these narratives and, um, that would be written with a faculty member and somebody from the community telling parts of the story to help us be part of the national narrative. Did you guys know that um, a few years ago, Utah was seventh in opioid deaths in the nation? Seventh. Did you know that Utah's not that big of a state? That's huge. Opioids aren't the only thing that's affecting us. There's a lot of things affecting us, but that is something that's destroying families and really, really a problem. And we have the power to make a difference. And sometimes that difference is starting out by asking people, how can we make a difference? And that's what this project's aiming to do. So my question to you is, how do you think first-person narratives about the opioid crisis in Utah enhance the national narrative today and in the future? And I'm not that kind of professor that actually asks questions and then moves on. I'm that person that stays quiet till you answer. How do you think that could, like if I ask you that question and you tell me because you're part of that community and we have your voice, how can that help? Yes, ma'am.
Exactly. Real people, real problems, and real solutions. And how many of you, uh, I know you're like in um, 18, 19, 20, 21, but have you ever felt disenfranchised? Like a lot of people are making a bunch of decisions about things that are going to affect you, but they never asked you your opinion about it? Yeah, right? It, does that feel like awesome, or does it feel not so awesome? It feels downer, right? It's like you're making decisions about me. Like I, I, sometimes I, I'm an old lady. I'm 58 years old. And sometimes people are making decisions in our country that I'm not supporting. And that doesn't make me feel good when I don't feel like my voice is being taken into account. And so this whole idea of having first-person narratives to help us understand about this crisis and asking the people in deep in this crisis to give us opinions about how to solve this crisis sounds kind of smart to me. So having these narratives available for um, legislators to read or for people, um, physicians to read. Yeah, it sounds important. But one of the things that we all have to think about is this thing called diversity of lens. And sometimes we don't know what we don't know. I didn't, I told you, I didn't know about drug court. I did not know about it. But then Andrew told me about it and he taught me about it. Now, I'm not going to pretend like I'm a, a, an expert on drug court. I've written a couple of articles about it, but what I've written about is that, that from my perspective and what I've learned and about the history and the folklore behind it. But I, I don't know what it's like to get up in front of the judge and, you know, something happens and I'm back in a holding cell. I don't know what that feels like. But I have talked with enough people and we've got enough experiences in this collection to let us take a glimpse inside it and to give honoring that experience. And I feel like that diversity of lens is important. And I know uh, we interviewed the judge um, for our project, and he talked a lot about his perspective and why he really was so adamant about starting the drug court 20 years ago in Cache Valley and then in Ridge County, which is our sister county, or um, excuse me, in Box Elder County. And it's because he wants to break cycles of addiction, um, substance abuse disorder in families. And that's something he felt st strongly about. But this diversity of lens, how people come to competency about different cultural um, nuances is going to be by either interacting with somebody that's cu culturally competent, like Andrew, or seeing a first-person narrative. So I have wanted to try something out with you. I hope it doesn't flop, but if it does, it's okay, because failure is where you learn. We're doing something called a community conversation. David, Dr. Allred mentioned that I'm the chair of Utah Humanities. He was a chair... Um, a couple of years ago. Um, we've known each other for years in a variety of ways. But Utah Humanities is an organization through the state of Utah that helps partner with other humanities organizations. And one of the things that we're trying to do is get voices, people with different um, worldviews, different cultural competencies coming together. And one way we do that is around humanities. And what's more uh, human than a poem? And so I would ask you guys, we have... Um, a few more minutes. I will ask everybody to partner up with one or two or three people. So if you're not sitting by someone, if you just stand up and move over. Um, so Terry McKinley, you're a great, but maybe a young lady right here that's just looking, maybe you could just partner up with those guys. You know, just move. Just be by somebody. And I'd like you to read this poem, and then we're going to um, talk about it in just a second, but you're not going to talk it out loud. You're going to talk amongst yourself. But we're going to do a community conversation prompt, and we're using Sharon O's poem, Summer Solstice, New York City. So I'm going to be quiet for five minutes. Read the poem, and then I would like you to do this. I'd like you to talk about whose voices are in this poem. And I'm going to come down here and be with these two ladies. Can you turn my mic off? Thanks.
being in quiet groups and listening to people talk amongst themselves. I really love this poem. And the reason I love this poem is because it quickly allows us all to be, um, see ourselves in one of those roles. And with Sydney and, and Audrey and I, we were talking about um, a variety of different things, but including um, feeling cold at the beginning and feeling warm at the end, um, Audrey said. And I feel like, yeah, you know, this is a, something that could resonate in a variety of ways. Do you mind hollering out some of the things you all chatted about, some themes? And even if you wanted to talk about some of these voices or what the cigarette might mean in other ways, or t something totally different. Pardon? Empathy. Cigarettes like empathy. Yeah, I like that. Thank you, sir. What else? Yes. Yes. So for those of you in the back and those of you in Price, the comment was, without having all those voices, and so we've kind of got three voices. Would you agree there's three kinds of voices there? What's the main voice there? Who's the person we're reading about mostly? Who? Howler it out super loud. The man, the person that's, you know, putting his leg over something, right? The person in distress of some sort. And we're inferring that they're going to do what? They're going to they're going to jump off something probably. Yeah. So who's another voice? And it doesn't have to be like individual people, but that person happens to be that one voice is a one person. What's another voice of kind of a few people? The police, right? And then there's another group of people, another voice. Yeah, the audience, right? And so I'm going to suggest to you, um, we're going to be using these in some of our community conversations. They'll be hour long, and there'll be a lot of prompts, and there'll be a lot of conversation about uh, valuing voice and about a lot of cool... Um, um, actually, I'm going to tell you what those are, because I think that would be important for you to know. I, I put some, you know, that we do with the oral history, the, the kind of the, the rules, if you will. But let me just tell you in a community conversation what some of those are. Um, what will we do without our phones? Conversation agreements. I agree to share airtime. I agree to respect all participants. I agree to speak my convictions with kindness. I agree to support natural silences with inward reflection. I agree to silence my cell phone and use only when necessary. I agree to honor the confidentiality of participants in conversations. I agree to thoughtfully consider perspectives which are contrary to my own. And I agree to behave courteously should disagreement and or a non-closure occur. So why am I having you read this poem? What's up with that? This whole work that I do about advocacy, about giving voice, but then this idea of amplifying that and bringing people with maybe different opinions, coming to have a conversation around something. And sometimes it's easier to start a conversation around a poem. The humanities just help us out. All the time they help us out. Studies prove and show time and time again, people that are engaged in the humanities, whether it's piano lessons, music lessons, poetry, writing, um, all these help us to learn better. And so I'm positing to you that through being able to have a conversation around these three different voices and with um, these conversations around the opioid crisis, we've got a person in crisis, right, in this poem. And then we've got a person who's coming to help, and that might be a variety of folks. It could be the mom, the dad. Who else could it be? I mean, I talk about the judge and judge court, right? It could be folks like that, a counselor. But then there's just the rest of us. Remember I told you when I met Andrew, I'd never heard of drug court before? And Andrew was showing me and helping me come on that stage. I'm not, I, I was just an observer. I was just that person on the ground watching and noticing. But as Sydney and Audrey and I talked about, they didn't walk on by. They didn't walk on by. They stopped. Maybe some of them got out their cell phone and called the police. We don't know all the details in that poem. 
But they didn't walk on by. They stopped and waited. And they were having what you said, sir, empathy. Right? They were engaging. What else did you talk about in this poem? What other things resonated for you? What about the title of it? Yes. What did he have to do before he did his job? What did he put on? Yeah, because he doesn't know what's going to happen, right? So he's actually saying, I'm going to risk my life to save a life, right? There's a lot of interesting imagery there. I agree. That is a, and what do you guys think about that really cool piece in it when they're talking about, how many of you have been lost and your mom found you and started yelling at you because they were so scared? Like, hi, I've been that mom. I did that the other day with my grandson of a bare leg. I'm like, Ren, what's up with you? And then I'm like, oh, I'm so glad he's found, but why am I yelling at him? That's dumb. The police officer didn't yell at him, right? He brings him in, and then he goes lip to lip with a cigarette. How really intimate and personal, right? Okay, you're like, weird lady. Why is she doing this? I'm saying the stuff I do is personal. It's personal to the people I'm working with. It's personal to me, and it's personal to people who may not know they're interested in knowing about opioids or about refugees in Cache Valley, or about the myriad of things we work on. And it may be something in your life that you think needs as an excluded voice, that you might want to try to figure out a way to help that voice be um, more in a light. Or it might be something that you want to be active and actively engaged in. And right now you might be a bystander. You might not be the police officer or the person that's having the crisis. But you recognize that, and you might want to do something about it. It might be about climate disruption. It might be about something, it's snow college that's happening that you want to see differently. But I feel like change is what being young is about. It's about figuring out ways to make something better. How many of you know about Greta Thunberg, who is a climate activist? A young woman, 16 years old, shaking up the patriarchy. This young woman's doing amazing things. And I feel like you're going to do amazing things. And I feel like you're getting an incredible start here at Snow College, my alma mater, where people care about you and are curious to help you thrive. And it's Utah State University, which, by the way, a lot of Snow College um, grads go to. Just going to put in a plug there. We love you to come. But I want to just end and then give you one minute to talk, or three or five. You know, community-driven ethnography is important. And we've talked about, a few of you have mentioned, you know, giving voice to people. But I will just say to you, it's a really important place for people to feel honored, to know that their voice matters, to be able to have people find it in a different context, to write about it, to write articles. And so I've tried to do that. I've tried to write about it. I've tried to speak about it to a variety of places, including getting this great forum today from Dr. Allred to come and chat with you about so I am talking about the opioid crisis. I am talking about honoring voices. But I'm talking about also figuring out ways to be active and activists in your own world. It may not be in the same way that someone else is doing it. And it may be that you're doing it through an academic lens like I've done during my career and writing about it or presenting about it. And it might be joining a board. But it might be Peace Corps. It might be a variety of other things. But honor the voices of the people that you hear. It takes, uh, it takes some energy. And so for this project, I just want you to know, being an activist, wherever you find yourself, it's super rewarding. It's super hard. Let me just tell you something personal. I, you you got to be professional in all of your jobs, right? So do you think sobbing uncontrollably is um, super professional? Like, right, it's not. Like, that's like super unprofessional. I have interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people, and I rarely cry. I just, I've heard hard things. Let me tell you, when I was involved in um, sitting in drug court for the first few months, I sobbed like ugly, ugly cry because I was taking in information that was so new to me. And so it's not easy work to, to be 
um, involved and actively engaged in something. But it's important and rewarding work. Um, whether you're working with the work that I'm doing, it facilitates dialogue in families and communities, especially with the opioid crisis, and is hopefully helping reduce stigma. I don't know your story. I don't know, but I do know that it is affecting many families. And so if that's part of your story, recognize that people do honor that story, see that story, and are trying to figure out, and you can be part of that, that, that storytelling and that recognizing that we're trying to give voice to communities, making space for the historical context, for somebody to write about it, figure out something about it. And we're trying to apply a very um, wide interpretive lens that includes the community interpreting. And so I appreciate you giving me time to come today. I have a couple minutes. I do want to say, if you don't want your poem, that's great. And um, there's some recycling bins. Let's not you know, make the carbon footprint any worse than it is. We'll keep it. It's worth reading again. It's pretty impactful. Do you have any questions or comments or ideas for me? Yeah, I'd love to chat with you. I love questions. Yes, ma'am. Speak really loud. For some reason, I can't hear very good. That is one of the best questions I've ever had. I love that question. Really great. By the way, I'm going to go on a side note. Answers are a dime a dozen. But a question, that's the most important thing, right? That's a great question. I'm going to repeat it. The question is, why would somebody want to do drug court? It's expensive. She hears the word court, she thinks expensive. She's like, why would I want to be a part of drug court? It's going to be expensive. It's going to be, I've got to do all these appointments, which I didn't even know how you knew that, but you are right. A lot of appointments. I'll tell you why. Drug court or prison? And the choices, the person that's standing in front of the judge, they make that distinction. The judge says, you know, are you going to sign on to drug court? And they have an attorney sitting next to them, and he's asked them all these questions. Have you been coerced to do this? Have somebody paying you money to do this? They say, no, I want to do it. They make sure that they want to do it because it is expensive. You've got to do two urine analysis, two to three a week. And they're not cheap, they're like $15. And if you go on the run, you've got to have an ankle bracelet at some point, and they're not cheap. And there's money you've got to pay. But again, drug court or prison. And I, I would love to talk to any of you about drug court. You can go and read, it. I have an article in the um, Utah Historical Quarterly of uh, last year that talks about drug court. You can just Google drug court. If you're curious about drug courts, Google it. That's the reason in a nutshell. People would prefer, and then you get expungement from your record about um, your felonies or your um, misdemeanors. That's why people sign up for drug court. But it's also counseling and a variety of things to help you. It's not just get over being on drugs, because that's not easy to do. It's hard. It's counseling. It's a lot of steps. And it's 12 steps programs. And it's a book group. And it's Addicts to Athletes. Although I don't like the word addicts, there is a program called Addicts to Athletes. And it's running. My husband's been talking about, maybe talking to the judge about doing a um, hiking club. It's just a lot of interactions. There's so much more to drug court than I was communicating to you, because I'm trying to talk about the idea of collecting those stories and making them available. If you want to know about drug court, go to Utah State University's digital collection and listen to people tell about drug court in their own words. Thank you, Badgers, for letting me come. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.